Idolatry can, speaking of idolatry, um, idolatry can express itself through anxiety, disputes, or despair over unattained desires. Uh, rage is not caused by upbringing or chemistry, like we talked about before. Th these are influencing factors from our environment or our family, but they are not determinative. Uh, jealousy and envy are not socially learned behaviors. They are conceived in the flesh. They come from the flesh. So the flesh is naturally committed to think, feel, and act in wrath, jealousy, and envy. So uh, A, from it flows the springs of life. That is the heart. Remember we learned this morning about the centrality of the heart, it is like the control center of our being. And therefore, if Proverbs 4.23, where we are to keep it with all diligence, for out of it flows, uh, flow the issues of life. And so number one, uh, the heart is the home base for our thinking, feeling, and, and our actions. And Jesus said, it is that which comes out of the heart that defiles a man. And so the evil thoughts uh, that he lists here, actually you'll notice they pretty much all align with, uh, with one of the commandments. Adulteries, seventh commandment, fornication. Um, well, you could say that could go under no other gods. In a sense, that's the second commandment. Murders, the sixth commandment. Theft, eighth. Covetous, tenth. Deceit or lying, ninth. Evil eye, which is envy. Covetousness, that's the tenth. Blasphemy is the third commandment. And so we see that in the chart that is there. And then number two, the sinful flesh is rooted in the heart, and from it proceeds all those things. So that's the second line. Sorry, sir, you, you say that one again? Yes, number two, the sinful flesh is rooted in the heart, and from it proceeds the deeds of the flesh. So you see there the heart and the arrows, and you see the same sins, and it's just that what has changed is the last word. So in the thoughts or the cognition, we have immoral thoughts, and then it produces immoral affections, and then it produces immoral actions. So the three just carry from one to the next. Impure thoughts, impure affections, impure actions. Sensual thoughts, sensual uh, I, no, that one does not continue. Uh, it should, though. Idolatrous thoughts, idolatrous affections, idolatrous actions. Okay, so sinful flesh is rooted in the heart, and from it proceeds the deeds of the flesh. So again, the heart is central. And then number three, the Holy Spirit dwells in the heart, and from it proceeds the fruit of of his spirit. That's 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have of God. You are not your own. You're bought with a price. And then the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. So we have uh, cognition, loving thoughts, affection, loving affections, volition, loving actions, and those carry across. Thoughts of self-control, uh, affection, God's affections regarding self-control, our con actions are uh, in line with God's will. So it all comes under the control of the Holy Spirit. And then B, from it pours forth the mouth. The words of a person find their origin in the heart, Matthew 12, 
33 to 35. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And then the thoughts of a person find their origin in the heart. And there are the verses. And what, it is what proceeds out of the mouth that defiles a man. It's not what goes into the stomach, although we can certainly eat the wrong thing and get sick, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. What we eat has nothing to do with morality or spirituality, but what comes out of the heart, what comes out of the mouth has originated in the heart. And so, let her see it is the, it is the cosmic battleground. That is where the uh, war is waged, is in the heart, between the flesh having control and the spirit having control. Okay. So, number one, God wants the human heart. He, is, uh, he wants control. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken spirit and a contrite heart you will not despise. And then Joel 2.13, under that same point, there, where God says through Joel, rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Uh, you know, we see God and evil together, and we wonder, why is, why is that? But a better rendering would be uh, the calamity, the affliction, the adversity. So God would change his mind and not follow through with his chastening hand uh, because the heart has changed. Okay, then we have, uh, we call them the three collisions. Number two uh, is the first, where God's purposes and Satan's purposes collide. Uh, they, all these points are about what's going on in the heart. Uh, we have first uh, Satan tempting Eve in the garden. And then we, we see for, in, as another example, Mark chapter 4, the sower. Uh, immediately Satan comes and he takes away the seed that was sown in the heart because the soil is hard. It doesn't go into the soil and Satan easily comes and takes it by, you know, a distraction or whatever means he uses. And then number three, where the gospel of Christ and deceits of the world collide. And we see this in that same parable as he continues in Mark chapter 4, uh, where the seed is sown among thorns. And there the cares of the world, the deceit from riches, meaning, you know, now I'll be a happy person because, you know, I have my fortunes or I have my bank account or I have, you know, money and stuff. And then the lust of other things, they come in and choke the word, and there is, there is no spiritual fruit. So the seed was sown, but it did not produce anything. Nothing came of it. There's no evidence of salvation. Um, is this person saved? Mm, good question. I don't know. You know a tree by, a tree by its fruit, and here's a barren tree. So, um, I'll just say I, I wouldn't want to be this person. How's that? And then number four, where the spirit and the flesh, where the spirit and the flesh collide. This is in the heart. Uh, for Galatians five seventeen, for the flesh sets itself against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. It looks like a, a wrestling match. I mean, you would think that hands down the, the spirit, you know, immediately pins the flesh. But it's more like it's more like 50 50. Because it's our volition. What do we want? The flesh or the spirit? As far as the flesh and the spirit, there's no contest because the flesh has already been crucified. It's already lost. It has no power except the power that we allow it to have. 
through the satanic lies. So, okay. Then you see this. Let's, let's not look at that chart yet because actually kind of explaining what's on the chart and then we can go back and look at the chart and it'll make more sense because we've already covered each point. Okay, so number two, page 99, uh, the, the descent into depression. So now we're talking about depression. And the flesh is very much involved with depression. Uh, the, depression the descent into depression is a visual uh, aid during the segment, it's talking about the chart. And to explain the principle that we've been talking about, whatever rules our hearts, rules our lives. That's the point that's made. So, A, uh, pride and self-rule is the first point. Reigning in our souls, we are in a fallen state, and we are hardwired to operate this way. Uh, let me read this first. If uh, if love for self is the dominating ambition of the heart, the selfish desires abound. The most basic, um, the most basic being, lusting for what we don't have. Number one, this is a big thing: lusting, wanting, desiring what we do not have, but we want. And number two, fearing loss of what we do have, or uh, fearing never getting what we desire to have. So these are the two things, and we, these are on both sides of the, of the heart on that chart there. So, number one, uh, we are all born steeped in pride and self-rule. It, it happens that way. I have that picture of my cute little grand, our cute little grandson over there, and I try not to think about these, this aspect of his little being because uh, it's not edifying, but I know it's true. And uh, there's actually been a couple little displays of the... He's evidenced, actually, the truth of the scriptures already as a three-and-a-half-month-old. Uh, and number two, we age and develop in life with total concern for self. Psalm 14, 1, that we have all gone astray. We have all together become filthy. There is... Uh, none righteous, there is none that doeth good. And then Romans 3, quite a picture of us in our unregenerated regenerated state. Uh, we are all under sin. And then Paul elaborates and talks about the throat, in the tongue, in the lips, in the mouth, in the feet, in the way that we take, in the eyes. It's, it's quite, a, quite a picture. And for that reason, there will be no flesh justified uh, by the law. No flesh will glory in his sight. It's an abomination to God. Letter B, the primal expression of uh, lust, uh, rather of uh, the flesh, is lust and fear. And so uh, we lust after money and... Um, and then we're discontented, we're fearful of not having uh, what we need. And so the response to that is Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Let your conversation, your behavior, your lifestyle uh, be without covetousness, he said, and be content with such things as we have because the Lord is our helper. We will not fear, and he will never leave us or forsake us. Uh, but the flesh doesn't really care about the Lord anyways, because it wants what it wants. Um, so, number one, lust. This may involve money, sexual pleasure, approval, respect, possessions, status, or companionship. Companionship, and we could add to that comfort and safety and security. Not that there's anything uh, innately wrong with with uh, those things, uh, but when they replace God, then there's a problem. 
Number two, fear. This may involve poverty, physical pain, disapproval, disrespect, humiliation, or loneliness. Well, yeah, on one hand, you know, who wants any, any of that? But it is sometimes some of those things are part of life, and there's something more important than not being disapproved by someone or being disrespected by someone or suffering personal pain, and that is God's will, because sometimes those things are his will. So let her see. The fleshly expressions as, uh, in the descent into depression is to obtain, to get, and then once getting, to protect, to not lose. So there's this control factor that is always present. And some people, you know, have a tendency to be very controlling. They have to control everything. They have to be in charge. If they're not in control, they're terribly insecure. So uh, the fleshly expressions control or obtain to protect. So once the desire, well, let me go over to number one, lust to control and to obtain. And that's James 4, 1, 3. Again, where he talks about from whence comes wars and fightings among you. Come they not um, from the lust, that war in your members, he asks. And the answer is, is yes. And then number two, there is um, fear, control to protect. So I got to have this, I got to have this, I got to have this. Without this, I'll never be happy. That's all I want. And, um, you know, sometimes you see it in, in uh, unwise choice in marriage. You know, especially, no, not necessarily for young people, but usually for young people. And um, a couple is in a hurry to get married. Married, we're in love with each other, and, you know, you're kind of horrified, but you just know that it's, it's, a, it's not going to work. And, you know, you just pray and try and get through to spare them the pain that you know is going to be is going to be down the road for them maybe not even far down the road but they're just convinced that they cannot live with each other and um, and so there's this you know control and you think things are good and then you find out that uh, they eloped and then you go okay guess it's out of <laughs> Yes, it is what it is. We'll watch what happens. And then you're available. Of course, come in, let's talk, because there's trouble. And man, and it's, a, it's a, years go by, and it's just a roller coaster ride. How are you doing today? We're not together. You know, she moved out. And then uh, we're back together. We're working it out. Great, awesome. Come on in, let's talk. And come in and talk, and you don't see him for months. And come, uh, we're, we're not together again. And, and then, yeah, we're back together. And horrible. It's just this terrible way to live. But the, the lust of the heart wanted its way and got its way and then wasn't very happy. And then number two, uh, fear. Maybe it could be something that we really wanted, that we really got, that we really liked to the point that all we can think about is having fear of not keeping what we wanted so much that we finally got. It's terrible. Because ultimately we lose everything because we die. And this thing that's so dear to us, we're going to lose it. The only thing we can't lose is Christ. And we're so thankful for that fact. So there is the fear, um, fear, control to protect. We see, we talked about this, mentioned it, Abraham and Abimelech. You know, Abraham, father of our faith, but he had a bad day. He had a weak moment. All of a sudden, his flesh in fear, going to lose my wife. Uh, so she's my sister, which was, you know, let's, let's be honest about this. You know how we are. We're pretty crafty when it comes to reasoning in our uh, reasoning things, because he could say uh, it was a half truth. And he saved his, you know, you could rationalize and say, well, she is. She is really kind of my sister. She's a half-sister. So who is this woman? It's my sister. Well, it is true she's a half-sister, but the important part is she's your wife because he wants her. 
right? That's really the most important point, to communicate to the king. I'm sorry, Mr. King of Bimelech, that's my wife. But he was afraid, and after all, the, you know, God gave him the promise that the land would be his, and so obviously you're going to have a descendant, and obviously you're not going to die because how are you going to have a child if you're dead, you know? But when we're under threat and fearing for our life, we don't always think so clearly and soundly. Um, and then somehow, years later, you know, Isaac did the same thing. <laughs> he lied to a different Abimelech, which was more of a, which was a, actually a title, I believe. So once the desire uh, takes root, the flesh response is to seize control and obtain what we lust for. And then we see uh, there is intimidation, the intimidation factor uh, regarding, for example, respect. Uh, we want respect, so pride intimidates so that respect is gained. Uh, joking, for example, people can joke, which is really, uh, it's pride because it wants attention. And then, uh, and then there's a, the guy who's a workaholic, and he is, uh, you know, he's working hard because he wants the promotion, because that's everything to him. You know, I am successful. I am a high achiever. I will get that promotion. You know, promotion is good. And telling clean jokes at in, in the right time is, is, is great. And, uh, you know, can't say much for intimidation on the good side. But, uh, you know, when those things are sought because of pride, it's my kingdom, it's self, it's all about me, you know, then, then it's out of place. And then regarding fear, um, uh, I'm fearful, so I, my approach is intimidation. And that is, uh, to, I intimidate people, and I'm just a tough guy because I don't want to be hurt. So that's, that's the fear side. And then uh, I tell jokes all the time because I'm fearful, and I don't want you know, to get too close to people. So I just kind of keep them happy. And, and uh, you know, my strength is being a comedian. And then um, I'm a workaholic, but I, I'm a workaholic because um, I fear losing my job and um, I want job security. So, you know, so it either goes on the, on the pride side or it goes on the fear side. At the same, we see the same things. Um, so the natural outcome of this as we, remember this is the descent into depression and it all comes from the fleshly heart and it's ruled by fear or pride. And so now once this has taken place, then there's, uh, depending which way it goes, there's either arrogance or there's anger. So let's take a look. Uh, number one, efforts to control, succeed. And so got my way, I am intimidating, people are moving out of the way for me, I'm getting what I want. So what's the result of that? Uh, now I'm more proud than I was before. Now I am arrogant. I am just, I am the king. I am number one. I mean, it was always all about me, but now you're noticing. I always knew I was number one. Now you can see it. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So that's arrogance. The pride increases. Then Ecclesiastes um, 8.11. This, uh, this, this verse is has always been uh, so interesting to me. How many know right off the bat Ecclesiastes 8.11? Is that one of those verses that you... Okay, we all have those, and this just happens to be one that stuck with me. It says, because sentence against an evil work is not executed uh, speedily, therefore uh, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Does that make sense? So, 
I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. It seems like it's okay because God certainly isn't coming down on me. He's not getting involved, so, you know, uh, the heart becomes emboldened to continue going the wrong way, thinking that there are no, you know, negative consequences. But, of course, <laughs> God's in charge of, of when things happen. And then Daniel uh, 4.30, you know, uh, is not this the great Babylon, says King Nebuchadnezzar. And it seemed like, you know, his heart is set on doing evil, and he's King Nebuchadnezzar. And one day, when he looked up, and he, he just looked out, and he said, all this is by my power. I am the great Nebuchadnezzar. Oh. All of a sudden, he loses his mind. There's a term for that when you think you're an animal, and that's not coming to me right now. But, uh, and there are uh, actually recorded... Uh, historical people throughout history, I don't know how many, but who actually suffered from this disease of thinking they were a barnyard animal. And um, so God had his way of humbling the great king as he's out in the pasture, uh, you know, acting and living like a, a beast of the, of the, of the barnyard. And Notice when his sense came back to him, he said God is able to humble those who are proud. He was never quite the same after that in a very positive way. So number two, efforts to control fail. And so what is the result? But it is anger. And we see this in Matthew 2.16. When Herod in his great pride um, realized that he was mocked, he became outraged. And we know what happened to the baby boys two years and under um, in Bethlehem. So it goes either way, either emboldened and more arrogant or rageful and on the attack mode. I'm starting to see that maybe it's not such a good idea to live in the flesh. Really kind of a no win situation. It's a dead end road. You know, the, 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 the beautiful 95 turns into a cul de sac. You go, this is as far as it goes. That's as good as it gets. That's the end. Descends. And then um, uh, it actually gets worse because letter E, the cycle accelerates. Uh, if the success continues, is increased, then so is the pride. And if the failure increases, then so does the fear and the anger. And with increased pride comes increased lust and also increased fear. And then increased lust and fear is increased efforts to control. So everything gets heightened to a fevered pitch. There's going to be, uh, someone's going to, you know, someone's going to lose it. They're going to be out of control, and, um, you know, sometimes we read about it in the newspaper where somebody, unfortunately, or there's domestic violence or someone is, somebody shoots somebody because they could not control their flesh. And it got to that accelerated pace where they could no longer control, control it. And, of course, we see the hand of Satan in all of this. So the cycle accelerates, and then the cycle uh, ends up descending into uh, depression. I mean, real, legitimate, full-fledged depression. Uh, Ecclesiastes 5.10, interesting point. He that loves silver shall not be satisfied with silver nor he that loveth abundance with increase. <laughs> Sounds like a little bit of futility going on there. Well, okay. So we can, uh, I'm going to shift gears, so let's take a look at that chart now. And uh, so we see at the top is the 
heart filled with pride, and it is, uh, there is self-rule going on. And then on the left side, we see the, the lust, the desire side of the heart. And if, you, if we stick to the, uh, to the, there's a kind of a half circle there. So there's lust, there's pride in the heart, it, there's lust and desire. Then there's, um, uh, we can uh, deny or repress it, uh, that lust. And that, but it's still in the heart, it's there, it's present. And um, we think of uh, Ammon and, and Tamar, for example. He loved his half-sister. Well, we could say he lusted after his half-sister. And, uh, it, and it was in his heart. He didn't fulfill, he didn't gratify himself. Uh, and it, he was depressed. Remember that story? Uh, 2 Samuel 13. So he is repressing that desire, but it's still uh, solidly in his heart. Uh, But as it's repressed, it's only increasing, and it's building up steam. It's not mortified. And so the lust um, increases, and if it continues to be denied and repressed, then, you know, we see the arrow goes down into depression, a sense of hopelessness, helplessness, regretfulness, Life is just no, not worth living because I can't get what I want. So that's how that goes. Now we look at it, there's lust, and then uh, it, we see control to obtain. And then, if, uh, if we talk, as we talked about earlier, if we succeed in our effort, notice the arrow goes up. There's pride, or, and then the shame goes with the other side. The pride increases, but then there's empty vanity, and it goes right, it keeps recycling. If it's the fear side, there's fear, it's denied or repressed, the fear increases, and, um, and then it ends up also back into depression. That's just, there's nowhere else for it to go. That's where it goes. Um, so, that's, uh, you, can, you can look at those verses that go along with each little box, and there's quite a lesson in there. Okay, so that's all, that's about depression. And you go to the other side now, number three. Now we have the fruit of the Spirit side of things. So if Christ rules our hearts, he rules our lives. When Christ rules our lives, he changes what we love. And... He changes the way we think. He changes the way we feel. He changes what we do. Yet the change is a process, and we are slow to surrender everything to him. The more he becomes our shepherd, the less we lust and fear, the less we covet. And we come to the place of saying, not my will, but thine be done. So the ascent into joyful abundance, it's as bad as that other side is, is as good as, you know, this side on the, on the positive. It is beautiful. And I think I'm about ready to hear about that. Uh, the ascent into joyful abundance as a visual aid during the segment. So Christ and his rule, the primal expression of the heart filled with the Spirit, is contentment and peace. And contentment is reflected in Psalm 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, and I shall not lack, and he's my supplier. And that is a beautiful psalm, of course. Philippians 4, 11, Paul said, apparently this was a process for him because he had come to a place where he learned to be content in whatsoever state he was in. Maybe when John Mark forsook the team, uh, he hadn't learned it at that point in um, uh, Acts 13. He didn't sound too content when we read about his, uh, not violent, but his strong reaction to to the even consideration of taking 
this young disciple back on the, the greenhorn, back on the team. Wouldn't have anything to do with it. And so, you know, Paul was... Uh, time and experience and suffering has a way of softening us, doesn't it? Uh, it can also harden us and make us crusty. But if God has his way, we will become tenderized and compassionate and patient uh, because of our sufferings. And so Paul said that he learned to be content in, in all of his circumstances. And then he said a couple verses later that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Maybe that was part of his contentment. Content because it's, it's all going to work out fine because God's in control. And then Psalm 73, 25, um, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And besides you I desire nothing on earth. That doesn't, you don't just say that and have it be true. Unless you're a brand new Christian and your life has been changed. <laughs> and you think maybe it's easy. Uh, but as life goes on, you realize, oh, I guess I'm still here. You know, the old me is still hanging around. But to be able to say that after the years have gone by and have it be factual, that I desire nothing uh, on the earth but you. And God's, you know, God is bringing us to that place. Uh, then contentment, that was contentment. Peace, Psalm 23, 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. You know, have we been through the valley of the shadow of death? Uh, we probably all will, at least once or more times, going through that valley. Um, I think God would have us go through the valley. And we would see it as very threatening and to be avoided at all costs. God would see it as an opportunity for him to show himself faithful in the, in the worst situation. And that's how he looks at it. The spiritual expressions of, uh, of the heart filled with the spirit is trust God to provide and protect. In other words, there's a huge faith element that goes along with trusting and with the spirit rule of the heart. Contentment, number one, in good times and in bad times. Trust God to provide, Romans 8.32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? That's a great verse. Sometimes, um, you know, Nancy and I have reflected on, uh, you know, our lives and and it's true, sometimes we would admit that our life was even more exciting and satisfying during those very lean years um, on the mission field, especially at the beginning, coming home from the mission field, lean years, and uh, how we were forced to go to God constantly, four children, uh, you know, and all that goes with the family, and trusting God. And I can say, really, we never, we never lacked. How great it was to see God come through again and again over the years with this provision and that provision. And um, we could tell some stories could really tell some wonderful stories. Yeah. And you have your stories, too. We could have story time. Hey, Friday evening, we'll have story time. <laughs> you all have stories? The faithfulness of God? Hmm. That would be very edifying 
to hear those stories. Okay, uh, in, uh, and, I'll, and I'll, yeah, at that point, let me just conclude to say, I think almost all those provisions all came through God's people, sometimes unawares, you know. They didn't, they didn't know what they did meant at that time in our lives. It was so beautiful, the hand of God. And then peace in good times and bad. Um, Isaiah 41.10, I think we know this verse and, and so uh, appreciate the love of God that is shown through these words. Fear not, for I am with me. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. What's the rest of the verse? Fear not, for I am with thee. Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. And then God's on, and I didn't write the rest of it, that's why I'm asking you. Um, I will help thee, I will uphold thee in the right, with the right hand of my righteousness. And I forgot a little segment of it. And then uh, Hebrews 13, 6. Okay, now just thinking that, you know, we're in the woods here, all these trees we're looking at. We haven't lost our way, have we? We went on the, on the dark side, the flesh, the dead end that it leads to. We're on the um, spirit-filled side. We're talking about a shepherd who cares. We're talking about a God who is faithful. We're talking about a Savior who knows all things and wants us to draw near to him. And it says, the Lord is my helper. It says, I will not fear what man can do unto me. It's not going to let that cause there to be fear dominating my heart. And so we will wait upon God to provide and protect us. And therefore, we don't need to control people because that is a huge bondage because we can't control people. And to try to is to live a life that is um, uh, filled with friction, filled with fighting, filled with discontentment, and not to mention the results of that on the heart, blood pressure, and how it affects the body. It, it takes years off of our lives to live that way. So now we have letter D, the natural outcome uh, of spirit-filled heart, love and obedience. So love, and Jesus uses Mary as an example in Luke chapter 10. He said, really, this one thing is necessary. It's one thing that's needful. He goes, Mary, Mary got it right. She chose that which is needful. Sitting at Jesus' feet and just contently hearing his words, soaking it all in, and her level of stress and anxiety seemed to be about that of a corpse. I mean, she's just totally enthralled with, she's not even conscious of the need for the, the cooking and the guests and the house and the, and that can of course irritate people because why don't you give me a hand? But Jesus didn't seem to care about that. He was, he had meat to eat that Martha didn't know of. He's receiving from his father She's receiving from him, life is good. Martha's not tuned in, life is not good. Because all she can see is, you know, we got, you know, we got to put this spread out for our guests. You know, some people, you go over to their house, hey, it is what it is, sit down, you want something to eat. Other people, it's an event. I mean, the cleaning and this and that, and then to buy the new flowers, and nothing wrong with that either. But if, it, if the stress level goes through the roof, then, you know, then there's a problem. So, and why do we need to have it be at that level so that, hey, this is my house, you know, it's all about me. Is it about the guests or about me? 
we're really messed up people. <laughs> and believe me, a clean house is good. An organized house is good. I'm all about that. But I'm just saying, you know what I mean. Some people are just overboard because everything has to be perfect because we're having guests and, you know, I want them to basically, probably, you know, I want them to think well of us. We got it together. Okay. Anyways, I think I'm rambling right now. <laughs> and then, <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Okay, number two, obedience, uh, the behavioral outcome of our love for God. If I love God, at some point it's going to become visible. John 14, 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he's the one that loves me. My influence in that person's life is so great that my will is what is the way they live. They fulfill my desires. They seek first my kingdom. And as a result, they're really pretty contented people. Compare that to the other side of the ledger. When the flesh is, is always agitated and trying to control and living in fear, wanting to get what it wants, never happy, never content, can't sleep well, high blood pressure, talking negatively, Short fuse, angry, you know, go to work. What's up with him? I don't know. He's like, he's like that most of the time. You know, the new guy on the job wondering, is he always like that? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was in the hospital last week, actually. <laughs> Heard the ambulance showed up at his house and, you know, something with a high blood pressure or something. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just... Uh, I mean, we're talking about ourselves, actually, yeah. kind of. So we can have a good time mocking ourselves and saying, God, thank you that, you have, that there's a provision that we can be delivered from ourselves. That's, what, that's what really what we're talking about. Okay, so now this cycle accelerates. Wow. With trust and obedience, we see God work in his unfathomable ways. And that's Romans 8, 28 to 34. And it's the whole, if God be for us, who can be against us? Nobody. As we see God work in his unfathomable ways, our contentment, our peace, our trust and obedience increases all the more. And then what becomes evident is who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation because it'll be there, distress, that will happen, persecution could happen, famine, hope not, but can't rule out anything, nakedness, yep, peril, sword, could all happen. But even if it did, we are still more than conquerors. Doesn't mean it's a pleasant experience, but it still does not define us, because God is our king, and we're going to heaven. And so, last page, uh, the cycle ascends into, you know, there's not the cul-de-sac here. There's not the dead end. There's not the cliff that descends into depression and death. But there is, uh, the cycle ascends into joyful abundance. It ascends into heaven. It ascends into God's presence. It ascends into joy unspeakable and full of mercy. It ascends into eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it, has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has for those who love him. But we know these things uh, by the Spirit. We get a, I call it the scratch and sniff on earth because we get a little taste by the Spirit of God who is filling our heart, really what awaits us in heaven. Wouldn't that be so? Do people get to experience, you know, I say this uh, kind of with, you know, somberly, but do people actually get to uh, get a taste of hell 
before they go there? Is that possible? It is absolutely possible. Horrible. And do people get a taste of heaven before they get there? God's people? Yes, indeed. Well, so, um, number one, painful circumstances simply, because that's part of the equation, but they simply refine faith uh, into a purer faith. 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2, For as much then as Christ had suffered, has suffered for us in the flesh, in his body, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. And then faith yields more joy or joyful abundance, where Christ is all. Philippians 3, 7 to 11, Paul could be in that place and therefore say, I count all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. There's no way we can really let go of that which is precious to us unless there's something more precious that's within our reach. And that's why Paul could say, you know, the things that I boasted in, that he listed, you know, uh, of the tribe of Benjamin, a, Drew, a Jew, circumcised the eighth day, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That was his pride and joy, his pedigree, his schooling, his experience, his, you know, his stature, uh, um, his... Uh, religious stature in the Jewish community, Paul was the man. He was the guy, the influential one. He was the go-to guy. And he could take it all and, and deposit it in the dumpster and say, uh, that's not where my heart is, that I want Christ, as much of him as I can have. And then number four, the process of sanctification is a heart becoming more ruled by Christ and less ruled by selfish pride. Because it's not like, you know, this switch goes off and this switch goes on permanently. You know, we can have a day when basically we can sense like there's been like no flesh interference. It's like a blue sky. The sun is shining. It's like, wow, this is, I want every day to be like this. And then the next day, you know, it's kind of overcast and the flesh is like trying to move in again. And so we just acknowledge that that's the way it is in this life. But we don't submit to it. We choose to walk in the spirit and we sense the, you know, the headwind and uh, that we're kind of walking into the wind. We sense resistance out there in the world within our own heart or the, or the devil is after us in a uh, you know, stronger way that, that we sense. But we know what's going on. And we walk by faith, and we make progress, and it's all good. So uh, the transformation from pride and self-rule to Christ and his rule, a work of the Holy Spirit is taking place in this process of sanctification. Uh, we become a humble Christ follower, and through whatever happens, it's like Paul could say, you know, remove this thorn, Lord, you got to remove this thorn. I can't make it. It's the thing's going to kill me. I'm losing my mind. Uh, and God says, uh, after the third time, He goes, "Yeah, by the way, don't don't ask me anymore because I'm not going to take it." No, but I'll give you corresponding heaps of grace to really kind of nullify the effect of the thorn and. Um, but through it, I'll be working in something else also that you couldn't, you couldn't have without the thorn. You got to have the thorn to produce what, uh, you know, the peaceable fruits of righteousness. You need the thorn to humble you because I know what's going to happen without the thorn. You're going to end up, you know, the pride side is going to start filling up again. And I want to keep that sealed off. I want to keep you fully full over here on the spirit side keep this tank empty, and I can see what's coming, and so the thorn. The thorn's going to keep that side from filling up. And I'll give you grace to keep going with the thorn. And his grace was sufficient. Because we know that because Paul comes to the end of his life, 
and he ran his course and he finished the race and he kept the faith and he crossed the finish line, a winner. It was perfect after all. Oh, we're so surprised, aren't we? That God got it right? Mm. Okay. And then letter D, uh, over God, uh, the, pro the process of sanctification. It's all happening uh, with the Father's appointed time. And this is sometimes hard to, hard to learn because we don't like to wait, but humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Just humble yourself. Shh. Humble yourself. Go low. Go low. Go low. And then he says that God may go up in due, in due season. Isn't that great? In lying low, God says, I want you to lie low. Just be quiet. Lie low. Wait on me. And then God's, God decides when, we, when he wants to exalt his children. And you see, as we finish this, this part, uh, that when God exalts his child, there's absolutely the control aspect that was so much a part of the old life is absent. When God is exalting, there's no need to control anything. There's just a flow that happens. It's a ride. It's a journey. It's an adventure. It's a thrill. And God's in control. And if God's in control and he's driving, if he's at the wheel of our life, then we can pretty much relax. You ever notice out on a trip, someone else is driving, you go, hey, this is pretty cool. I can read. I can do this. I can do that. I can look at the scenery. So God says, hey, let me drive. You can chill and you can, you know, enjoy the ride. So uh, finally, you know, we are in the process of being less controlled by pride and more controlled by God's spirit. This may be day by day, a little less of that, a little more on this side. We're learning to love Christ more and learning to live, love ourselves a little bit less. Uh, the energy we devote to promoting and protecting self will decrease and the energy we devote to promoting worshiping Jesus Christ will increase. And that is having our life go in the right direction. So in your own time, you can take a look at the, uh, the chart, Joyful Abundance, and, and really, uh, you know, enjoy that because it's a beautiful, glorious cycle that God would have us live on this page and not on page 98, right? We're page 100 livers, not page 98 livers. Livers. <laughs> livers. Okay. Uh, so, let's see. I think this section is worthy of a discussion. So why don't you go to discussion seven? And do you want to mix the groups? You want to have someone from each group go to another group and kind of mix it up a little bit? Credit students? Or oh, you like your groups? Are you being groupies? Okay, so why don't you choose one person in your group or that person voluntarily Go to go this direction, and so it's all going to be changed a little bit. 